Heard Online is back. And in today's episode, we are going to talk about a study that had a shocking impact on the world of sleep medicine. The fallout, which is still being dealt with today, including myself being fired from my previous job as a sleep doctor. We are going to review the 2016 SAVE study by McAvoy and co-workers published in the New England Journal of Medicine. We are going to take a look at this from a historical significance perspective. We're going to look at it from you know my own personal journey perspective. And also, most importantly, of course, from the perspective of somebody who has obstructed sleep apnea and or insomnia and worries about sleep apnea, because I think the results of the study can have a huge impact for you as well. Imagine the following. The world of sleep medicine has a feeling that obstructive sleep apnea is a really significant health issue that causes you know, an increased risk of, of stroke, of, of heart failure, of heart attacks, and that, that significantly reduces life expectancy. You know, This is what the sleep medicine world believes and thinks it has ample evidence for, but it has not been actually proven. There's been a lot of experimental studies, you know, smaller studies, but there hasn't been this large, randomized, multi-center, center, like a uh, center, um, you know, long duration study that, you know, proves this once and for all. So in 2016, in, in September, this is what the world is waiting for. They're waiting for the result of the SAVE study. You know, because, you know, finally an industry sponsored, you know, huge study, you know, huge for sleep medicine, in sleep medicine, in the sleep medicine world anyway, study has been taking place and, and the world is waiting for this, for the results. And, you know, little spoiler alert here, the, the results were very, very different from what people expected. So this is what we're going to review today. We're going to review McAvoy's uh, study and we're going to, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to sh share my personal uh, relationship with this, uh, with this study, which is... <laughs> You know, one of those like, you know, sort of like love hate relationships. Like, on one hand, you know, I feel kind of like warm and fuzzy because this study, you know, it, it aligns so very much with how I practice medicine and how, how I saw things. But it also, you know, made me a kind of sort of a persona non grata in, in, in my workplace. And I felt like in, this, in the sleep medicine field in general, and I was eventually fired. And I think a, a lot because of the this, this study that we're going to look at. But let's jump into it. And then and we'll go back to these kind of all these, these other stories around it. So McEvoy and co co-workers wanted to, you know, really look at whether uh, treating obstructive sleep apnea actually reduced uh, cardiovascular risk, which is an indirect way of looking at whether obstructive sleep apnea truly ha has these impacts that that were, were postulated, right? So this is the study. I just want to show it to you. It's from the New England Journal of Medicine, like, you know, one of the most you know preeminent journals uh, in, in the field of medicine, 2016. And the title is CPAP for Prevention of Cardiovascular Events in Obstructive Sleep Apnea. You know, very straightforward title, nice title. And you know, see many make Collaborates. It was again a multi multi center study, and uh, McAvoy I think is in, based in Australia. The lead author. Now I, I kind of summarized it here, and I <laughs> that was very easy for me because I have summarized this for so many patients over the years, and I had my own acronym in our in our e e EMR chart uh, where I where I summarized it. But anyway, this is what they did. So they recruited a total of they, they recruited many many adults uh, as potential participants, but they. They selected 2,717 adults that met, you know, uh, criteria for, for for the study, and these were adults that had heart disease. You know, so th th these are these are um, patients, uh, or in this case, subjects, because it's a research study, a research study, right? So these are subjects who had had a heart attack, or had angina, or had had a stroke. You know, they had had something, some type of cardiovascular event in, in the past. And why did they choose? to include people that had cardiovascular disease. Well, it's because, of course, if you've had that in a cardiovascular event, you are more likely to have it in the future. If they had chosen like random people, then if there were no cardiovascular events, then you didn't really say much, right? But they chose they purposely chose people who had who are at high risk for having another cardiovascular event, you know, which is the, what they want to study. They want to study the impact of CPAP, which is the you know standard 
treatment for, for sleep apnea on these, on these uh, outcomes. So they had almost 3,000 people with known heart disease and also moderate to severe sleep apnea. They, they, they didn't want mild sleep apnea because, again, they wanted clear results. So they chose people with moderate or severe sleep apnea. And then they randomized these 2,700 people. You know, so you know, about half of them got a, a CPAP machine and CPAP treatment. About half of them, no, no CPAP, right, to make it very, very clear. And, and this is, again, this is kind of the nice study that can actually, you know, uh, sh you know d r reveal the truth. So as a primary outcome, the main thing they wanted to look at were um, death from cardiovascular causes, uh, heart attack, stroke, hospitalization uh, for angina, heart failure, or, or a TIA transient ischemic attack. You know, this is what they really wanted to look at. And of course, they want to look at which group would have more or less of these. Like, would it be the CPAP group, the, the people treated uh, for, for their sleep apnea, or the other group, right? And the secondary outcome things that they also looked at that were not the primary, not the, what they were most interested in, but they also looked at health-related quality of life, snoring symptoms, daytime sleepiness, and the mood. And the mean follow-up was 3.7 years. This was not, you know, this is not a short study. This was a study where they followed people over a nice duration of time. And of course, again, like the entire world of sleep medicine, you know, sleep doctors, you know, you know, sleep technicians, uh, you know, uh, respiratory therapists, uh, uh, people in industry, you know, CPAP uh, manufacturers, the salespeople, everyone is expecting this to just confirm what they thought they knew that, of course, CPAP was going to reduce the risk of of, uh, of 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 death from cardiovascular disease. It was going to, you know, uh, reduce mortality. It was going to do all these things. So this came as a true shock, like a, you know, to the to to uh, to everyone in the field. I think when the results came in. So the results were the following: in the CPAP. PAP group, 229 people, which were 17%, had had a cardiovascular event versus 207 or 15% in the no CPAP group. Statistically speaking, there's no difference, although the numbers is like actually a little slightly higher in the CPAP group. But again, statistically speaking, there is no difference. In other words, CPAP did nothing. CPAP didn't do anything to to uh, to prevent these events, or as the authors put it in their words, no significant effect on any individual or other composite cardiovascular endpoint was observed. And you know there there are basically like two ways you can interpret this. One is to say that CPAP is you know no good. You know it, it doesn't actually treat obstructive sleep apnea. And the other way to interpret this is that obstructive sleep apnea actually does not cause uh, these um, cardiovascular um, events that that it was postulated to cause, and you know, as far as I know, you know, this this study doesn't doesn't tell us which one it is. But anyone who has seen how effective CPAP is, uh, like myself, I think, you know, will we'll probably see this the way I see it, which is that CPAP is effective. You know, it's, it's actually very effective for obstructive sleep apnea. You know, whatever marker you use, it's very effective. So in all likelihood, the results of this study mean that obstructive sleep apnea actually does not cause these things that we thought it caused. You know, that's how I interpret the results. Now, how about the secondary outcome? I think this is also important to note that CPAP actually did reduce snoring and daytime sleepiness and improved quality of life and mood for, for the people with sleep apnea who are treated. And so to me, the signals that CPAP is very, very nice, very helpful, you know, for many people important, you know, uh, because because who doesn't want to sleep well or, or feel good? You know, that that's that's nice. So, you know, to to kind of like share a little bit of my personal story here, uh, when when I first learned of these results, it was actually like we, we had um, uh, f friends over for dinner and, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, the husband of this couple that we know mentioned that, oh, Daniel, have you seen this study? And I hadn't. So I just got my phone and I was like, okay, save study. And I was kind of shocked initially because I, I was also like, well, what does this mean? And I was like, what does this mean to me? You know, I'm a sleep doctor. And if sleep apnea is actually not dangerous, then what are we doing with like all these testing and prescribing CPAP machines and all this stuff? And, you know, it, it, I, I, I felt like the ground I was, I was standing on, like shaking, you know, that feeling like, you know, great uncertainty about the future there. But shortly after, I was sort of reassured because of those secondary endpoints. I felt like 
you know, even if sleep apnea doesn't cause you to, to have a stroke or a heart attack or die, that doesn't mean it's not important. You know, if you treat it and you have a great sense of well-being from, from the treatment, and that's fantastic, that's wonderful. And I was thinking it's the same thing as like, um, you know, if you have a, um, if you need a knee replacement, you know, somebody who has, um, you know, uh, problems with their, with their joint, you know, their knee joint and a lot of pain from it, they have a hard time walking, that doesn't, you know, cause, uh, uh, that doesn't increase your likelihood of death or, or, you know, it doesn't have any like severe health outcome like that, but it has a big quality of life impact. So a knee replacement, of course, is something very, very valuable. And I thought, you know, CPAP is the same, you know, uh, it, it has a great quality of life. Uh, at least it can lead to great quality of life improvement. So it's still something very important, but that doesn't mean that these results doesn't change the way you practice medicine. At least it changed it a lot for me because thinking that, you know, we need to properly diagnose people and treat them for, for these, you know, so we really take care of their health. That's different from thinking, oh, this is actually not something dangerous but it's a quality of life thing. And what our purpose, our mission really here is imp improve qual people's quality of life. So when I uh, had, uh, you know, um, patients that had like suspected of sleep apnea, but they actually were very asymptomatic. They were like, I, I sleep fine. I feel fine during the day. Then I'd often be like, we don't need to do anything. You know, we don't need to, to do that. Or when people were on like, uh, a, a uh, you know a BiPAP machine or something like that, and and it looked like the numbers from the machine looked like their the sleep apnea was not well treated, but they felt good. I'd be like, we don't need to do anything further. You know, if you feel good, that's that's all that matters. And th this really rubbed other, others the wrong way because you know if you're in this field where the, you know most of the revenue and income and and business, if you will, comes from testing people and retesting them and trying a new machine and and sending them to the sleep lab to see if the new machine works, et cetera. You know, it made people nervous and uncomfortable. and and uh, and I got you know, people who started to question what I was doing. But I always refer to the study. I was like, but the safe study shows this. and and by the way, you know, this is now I'm drifting off a little bit, but I think uh, you know, the, the consensus actually among like uh, payers uh, uh, in terms of like the, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, you know, is, is that this is being validated that, you know, that the fines of the study are being validated. So that, you know, feels good for me to know that. But anyways, I think eventually like my practice style became so different when it came to insomnia and sleep apnea that I was eventually let go. I was fired, uh, which, uh, you know, which is why I have this kind of like, you know, th this study, I, I think it, it aligned very much with how I see things and how, how I like to practice, but it also got me fired. So I, I have to kind of like mixed emotions about this, this safe study. But now that we talked about all this, uh, back to back to uh, the three points I want to make. And and one of them is, of course, about, uh, you know, insomnia and what, what are, do this channel is primarily about. So, but the first one is this one. If these results, if there's also this study, uh, are are not made clear to the public by the Academy of Sleep Medicine, the National Sleep Foundation, the CDC, et cetera, et cetera. What else are we not being properly educated upon? Like uh, on right that that's a, that's a big question for me. You know, I think a lot of these organizations inherently want to play up the risk of things, how dangerous something is, how important it is to do stuff, right? And um, and and that's kind of unfortunate because for a lot of us that are like in, you know, in the, in, 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 not experts on, on many, many medical things, right? We would feel really well if we were told like, don't worry, this is all fine. There's nothing to worry about. So our, what is our interest is in some ways like, you know, different from what is the interest of, uh, you know, uh, these kind of like NGOs and, uh, and, uh, you know, professional associations and things of that nature. So th this, this, I always think of the safe study as like, uh, something that is not, this information is not disseminated in what I think could be a really helpful and meaningful way by these organizations. And, you know, what else are we not really properly educated upon? Something that, that this brings, uh, to my mind. And, and secondly, and I think this is like, this is, Actually, why I'm doing this, of course, is the following, that I, I want to educate the public. And if you have have obstructive sleep apnea, with or without insomnia, like either way, if you have obstructive sleep apnea, and this is something that has scared you, and you've been kind of 
debating like should I go see to CPAP machine? Should I not do a CPAP machine? I, I hope that you feel easier and lighter today because you know, for all of us humans, I think when we sense that we're not in any dangers, there's nothing dangerous happening. I if I if I do this or that, it actually doesn't matter. What matters is just doing whatever feels feels good for me, you know that can make things easier and lighter. So I, I really hope that for you. And finally, just just a little thought on like, where do I think the results of the safe study, quote unquote, should, yeah, I kind of don't use the word should too much because I think it's there's some judgment there. But anyway, with that said, where do I think these results, quote unquote, should lead us? Well, I think this really should lead us to a place that the industry is, is kind of scared of. And it's the following. So if we start thinking of obstructive sleep app not as something that's uh, you, you know a health issue in terms of like impacting these hard outcomes on our health, but it's more like a wellness thing, you know, then why is it harder to get a CPAP machine, like buy a CPAP machine, than it is to buy buy like a chainsaw, you know? Why why is that? Why why do you have to get a prescription to get a CPAP machine, you know? Why do you have to do all this testing around it? Why can't you buy a CPAP machine at a Walmart, you know? And I don't really see a reason for that. And I don't think that necessarily means that we don't need sleep doctors or, or sleep medicine field because people will have questions about this, you know? People uh, uh, will often want to seek expertise and like have things explained for them, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, you know, the, 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 all this red tape around sleep apnea doesn't need to be there, you know? And we start thinking along those lines, then, you know, you realize that, although I think there's there, there still will be a need for sleep doctors, the, the need for all this like expensive testing, in-lab sleep testing, home sleep testing, whatever it is, it kind of falls away because it's not so important to know whether you have sleep apnea or not, or what degree you have to do what degree you have it. Because, you know, whether you have it or not, you're probably going to want to, you know, if you want treatment, you're probably going to try a CPAP machine. So instead of somebody like going to the primary care doctor, getting a referral to a sleep center, you know, waiting months and months to get a sleep study and then seeing the sleep doctor back and discussing results and then finally getting a prescription for a CPAP machine and then waiting for the DME to, to, to deliver it and then going through mask after mask, et cetera. It could just be like, I think I have sleep apnea. I'm going to buy a CPAP machine and, and you know, you go online and, and get some nice instruction. Maybe there's a sleep, you know, sleep apnea coach that can help you for like a fraction, a tiny, tiny fraction of the price. And you get the same results like that. To me, is is wonderful. I think that sounds wonderful. But of course, to to the industry, it's kind of scary. So, so uh, yeah, just just some thoughts on that. But we will conclude here. And I hope again, the main thing I want to do is always, you know, share a kind of a you know educate the uh, you know everyone in our community and the public and 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 share this kind of reassuring message that you know there is much, 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 much less to be afraid of in the sleep world that than, than we're, we're told over and over again. So I hope I hope this uh, brought a lot of relief uh, uh, to you. I hope you found it interesting and uh, thanks for being here and uh, I look forward to having you back real soon. Bye for now. Hi there, it's me, Coach Daniel. I hope you found a lot of value in the video you just watched. If you're looking for a bit more personalized support on your insomnia recovery journey, then head over to thesleepcrystal.com. I think it is the number one resource for insomnia sufferers worldwide. And you know, there you will find free programs as well as paid programs with certified sleep coaches. You can join a community of people who understand what you're going through because they've gone through it themselves or they are on this journey all believing the struggle and arriving where they want to be just like you, that place of peaceful sleep and peace of mind. So again, I hope the video just that you just saw brought a lot of value to you. And if you're looking for a bit more personalized support on your journey, then head over to thesleepcoachschool.com. And if you decide to join, we look forward to seeing you on the other side.